Um, we'll start by saying welcome. Uh, I'm Jessica Hollander. I'm the Associate Director of Experiential Education here on campus in our Leadership, Innovation, and Mobile Arts Center, Twilight, I'm also an alum. This series of presentations focuses on partnering with students in blended learning initiatives in the form of hands-on experience and competency-based approaches through collaborative methods. Uh, Ken Colton from and Miriam Pollan offer faculty and former student perspectives on college collaborative technology an active pedagogical process that develops a more egalitarian classroom by encouraging students to learn from and with one another. That will be the first talk. Hi, so I, uh, I'm Miriam Pellant. And Ken Colton from. And uh, I am an alum of Haverford. I graduated in 2014. Um, Ken and I first started working together as part of a program through Bryn Mawr called, and Haverford called the Teaching and Learning Institute of Teaching and Learning Initiative that pairs students and faculty together to talk about teaching and learning. So the student gets to hear about what the class looks like from the professor's perspective and vice versa. Um, now, I have, I'm just finishing up my third year as a teacher. I work at a high school in central Massachusetts. It's an independent school for kids with learning differences. And a lot of the work that I um, did with Ken in my time at Haverford has influenced my teaching now, working with students who rely um, a lot on assistive technology and just other materials to enhance their learning and facilitate it. Um, one of the important things that we're going to talk about today is using technology in the classroom with intention um, and not just for the sake of having gadgets. And it's really important to do that, I think, as a teacher at any level um, that it's very clear to your students why you're asking them to use a particular technology and that they're very cognizant of why use this over something else and not just, this is cool, let's, let's just try it. Right, the, the three different modules or, or technologies we're gonna talk about, one is using iPads in the classroom. Uh, the second one is gonna be about TEI Marco, um, which is a HTML software. And the, and the third one is about Prezi's and using Prezi's and how we use them uh, in the classroom. And on all three occasions, um, the guiding framework for me was how well these technologies could uh, enhance humanistic inquiry. And if it didn't do that, and you'll see that at certain moments it didn't do that, uh, I would just stop using it. It just didn't function the way I wanted it to function. Sometimes it was underhandedly productive despite student protest. But um, it was really towards uh, doing my job better rather than adding some kind of technological feature to it. The other important part of this technology, and, and I think both Miriam and I pro prospered for this, was the, the collaborative learning that we did, having two people in the classroom, or both of us engaging this, we could see different things and react in different ways. We said that one, and the, one of the issues with the iPads, where Miriam had just this beautiful insight on how to use them, I didn't see it at all. So I think that kind of collaborative space within the classroom was really helpful for both of us to understand how we use technology. Uh, yeah. So we'll start with the, uh, the iPads. So that's how Ken and I first started working together was in the fall of 2012 in a class called Jewish Images. Um, and do you want to just explain yeah, why? The, the point of using the iPads uh, for me was a couple things. I, I saw my students and maybe you probably see them too high behind their computer screens, or that, like as we see here. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's very easy to do, even if they're engaged in the class, what you end up having is 15 or whatever students that are just individually looking at their screens and sometimes looking up and not engaging with each other. And we thought if we had public technology, not private, but public, where it shared that technology, that might alleviate that kind of problem. Um, and, and we'll talk about whether how that worked and, and, and when it worked. It also, um, enable students to share in the content creation of the course. So we had a, it was a sort of pretty simple technology that we used where you could grab an iPad, find whatever image that we were discussing or related images, and then throw that up on the screen. We could do that with two or three images. So it was actually a great pedagogical tool um, in that respect, but it was also that kind of active learning of students actually producing that, and then we archived those images and those texts and then had a blog, and so it was a way of students really actively engaging in how we were going about the, the actual textual production, of course. 
So there were several ways in which this, the iPads were very effective. And the first one is sort of exactly that, to get people out from behind their computer screens and using technology for the best that it has to offer, but not, um, but not hiding behind it. And that worked. We had everybody sitting around a big circular table, and the iPads were in the middle. And people actually had to look at each other and exchange the iPad and um, say, can I have that? And can I use this? Or could you pass me that? And that innately created a very community-oriented feel, and at the same time also sort of challenged that professor stands up at the front of the class and students sit there and listens paradigm. It was very it put everybody on sort of even ground uh, to be able to contribute in the class, which was really nice. And since, as, as Ken mentioned, it was a, um, a heavily image-based class, so I think had it been, there was obviously accompanying text, but it was so key that this visual component was present and there. Um, and this, the, having the four iPads, all four screens projected in the front of the room was very effective. Um, to be able to have everybody making sure you were really looking at the same thing. And it, there was a learning curve. I mean, it, there was an evolution of attitude throughout the semester. It's at first, you know, you have somebody who has their own iPad. It's like, a, you can't pry them away from it. But as soon as you say, these are public, it's like people are very um, resistant. You know, they, they, it takes them a while to warm up to the fact that you can just reach for it. Or somebody, might, somebody else might be talking and you can say, can you please pass me that? So it took a while to achieve that organic flow, but I think uh, that really did evolve over the course of the semester, and the students mentioned that in the feedback that they gave at the mid-semester point and at the end of the semester point. Um, and I think people really had a sense of ownership of, of the iPads towards the end. They really felt like maybe at the beginning they didn't know how to work and actually use it. Correct. Yes, no, they didn't actually have that. Um, but they, they felt like they could use it and they had some authority over it. Um, there were a few, as I mentioned, a few drawbacks. It's, it takes a little while to figure out how to implement this and students are not always used to this public exchange of technology, whereas you can have five different things open on your own computer, you can't have that when you have a public iPad. Um, and we talked about a bunch of different ways to help this flow a little bit more easily. And one of the ways that we found to be effective is there were some students who were very comfortable just reaching for it and other students who were not as comfortable doing that. So what Ken would do at the beginning of class was put the iPads next to specific seats where the person might not be as comfortable reaching for it. And then it just happened to be there. And it's not 100% effective, but it at least puts the people in that. Um, position and we also talked a little bit about maybe designating some time for iPad group work where you have three people gather around one iPad and it's still community oriented that technology but it's not one person the whole class is not staring at one person um, and those kinds of things were effective and um, like I said by the end of the semester it was it was really um, a useful tool. I think this one doesn't add to what um, Marion is saying that we, we did have someone from our librarian staff come in and talk about how Google does Google searches. Because we had we had someone in Apple come to Howard and talk about the iPad as a, I remember, talk about it as a window to the internet. And that was really kind of an interesting image in the way that they understand that it's a kind of neutral kind of access. And we wanted to sort of undermine that. We heard that this morning in that talk about ways of undermine that kind of access. So it was very interesting to think about these Google searches. So when one student, I remember one example, we were talking about images of Moses, and the student grabbed the iPad and said, what about this image of Moses? And there it was. And I asked, so where did you get that image? And of course, he didn't know. He'd just done a Google search and clicked. So we went back and retraced it and found it and looked at the context within which that image arose. And it was a very, it was within a, actually this one was an evangelical Christian site. that had a very different understanding of how to read that image than within the context of the other images that we were looking at. So it enabled us to, to talk about different ways in which not only how to think about searches and what you're finding on it, what, how you grab that, but actually thinking about sources 
and, and, and thinking about context within which those images are used. Um, and the physicality of the iPad was important. And Miriam was a little bit, you were a little bit um, 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 not as, as forceful in the way that she moved me to move those iPads around. We originally, it was an oval table that we had in the classroom that was rather a large oval. So it was this middle ground. We had the iPads in the middle, and so it actually took some physical effort to go and reach. And that was also a public thing. You're going to actually reach and show people that you're going to get that iPad. And then Miriam said, what if we just put it around the circle? And that one suggestion alone actually transformed the way students use the iPad. So some of these, the physical dynamics of the classroom, I think, were germane to how we use the technology. The second uh, thing we want to talk about is TEI markup. Has anyone ever used this? Are you familiar with this at all? A little bit? Okay, so I'll give you a, just a little bit of background. Um, it's, it's a markup software that's, that's in the humanities is used most to digitalize text. If you have a manuscript and you want to make it in digital format, we use something that's called Oxygen. It's an XML editor. It's a common uh, editor program. You have to buy a subscription to it. In the library, bought, we bought a kind of number of subscriptions, so all of our students had access. That they could just download the software, and we could use it for up to a year. Um, and it, it, is, it is a lot of um, metadata that you're using to code text to create these digital formats. But we want, I wanted to use it as a way of doing close textual analysis, to force, in a way, students to slow down and by marking up individual sentences, in this case, it was in sections in Genesis, it was also part of Paul's Galatians and Romans, and to actually look at the terms and then having to mark it up such that it would force a kind of uh, recognition of certain kinds of uh, textual problems that arise in the text. The first thing that we did in that class is, um, and this time we could do it online, you can go online at a Bible site, and look at the various different translations of the first sentence in Genesis, which is an extraordinarily difficult uh, Hebrew text to translate. And you can see it, you, can just, you just go, you go King James, you do all the different ones, and you see that there are different variations of how to, how to translate it, and it changes the meaning entirely when you, when you translate that. It's, it's basically because the first word is actually very difficult to understand what it means. Reshit, which is the Hebrew name for that book. But what, in using this, in this markup language, I, I wanted students to do two things, and this was both actually very good and a problem for me and the students in the end. I wanted them to think about, about tagging and what and the certain kind of parameters to use metadata for particular texts and, and who's the audience and who you imagine an audience to be when you're making this translation into digital format. On the other hand, as I said, I wanted them to do close textual analysis. And so part of the problem is they, they weren't sure which of the ones they were trying to concentrate on. So there was this part of the issue here is there's a steep learning curve to learning XML markup. We didn't really have to learn it. We, we kind of dumbed it down. There's about, there's hundreds of tags and metadata tags you could use in the software. And we, together with the library staff, we sort of created like 25 of the most useful. So you didn't have to learn them all. It was sort of a, a, a small number. It was still difficult. We had great support, but it wasn't easy to get up to speed. It's one of these like, um, if you do a website, and if you're doing it once a month, it's, it's, it's not so bad. If you're doing it once a year, it's hard because you have to relearn. So for students, I think that the, um, the learning curve was steep. But part of the problem is that I was not clear with them exactly which of these two things I really wanted them to concentrate on. And it was those sort of two dynamics. So some students got really into just how to tag and the certain decisions they would have to make. And other, other folks would say, well, why are we using this for, for a close textual analysis? I can do that without the software. Like, I know how to do that, which they kind of didn't do. It sort of moved them to do it. But, but it was interesting that they saw that it was actually an impediment to do the very kind of thing that I wanted them to do. I learned this. This is always the, the downside of doing mid-semester reviews, because I got a lot of reviews from students saying, either the one or the other. That is, the software was too difficult. I, I can't remember what tags I'm going to use. Or why do it if we can just do textual analysis? So in the end, what I did is after, after about halfway through, I, we stopped using it. Some students continued to use it for their final projects. But and here's, here's what I mean. It was sort of effective despite the student protests. Um, there's a, we, we read Genesis 22, which is the sacrifice of Isaac um, seen in Genesis. And a student who didn't like using the software uh, came to me for his final paper and said, you know, 
I wish if I could just, if I could refocus this paper, I would have focused on this, this text in Genesis 22, I think verse 12, in which the angel cries from God says, Abraham, uh, do not let your hand touch the boy. And he, and he looked at me and he said, what happened to the knife? Because it's true, in the couple of seconds before, Abraham grabs a knife about to sacrifice his son Isaac, but then the angel calls down and says, do not let your hand touch the boy. I, I think, I, I sort of know this, he would never have seen that mm -hmm. if it weren't for this, the way we did use, the way we used XML software to, to make him slow down and read that. That's actually a, a, a wonderful scene because the rabbis in the sixth century recognized that too. And their solution is they created the story that um, the angels were so devastated that Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac that they shed tears and those tears melted the knife. And that explains why it was about his hand. He actually didn't have the knife anymore. But part of that, so it was effective in the sense it did exactly what I wanted them to do, slow down and see these kinds of nuances in the text. Although I think in the end, the technology got in the way. So the last uh, technology that Ken and I have worked together on is Prezi. Um, and he will explain in just a moment exactly how it fit into the, the course. Um, perhaps you've used Prezi. Uh, it is not, as I've heard it described, just a PowerPoint that makes you seasick. Um, <laughs> if you actually, again, use it with intention and um, know why you're using Prezi as opposed to something else, it can be incredibly effective for a number of reasons. It works, again, really well for, for information that is visual. So it's whether you need a world map, whether you need a web or something that's very visual, um, it's very easy to organize your information. You also have to be aware of your, your choices, basically. When you're, when you're doing a Prezi, the first thing you have to do is choose a template. And you can just choose the one that looks the coolest, but if you're doing, a, if you're if you're really engaging with the interface, you choose the template that makes the most sense for your information. So, is it a flow? Is it a hierarchy? Is it um, just a series of of um, a progression or whatever? Um, so, the other benefit of Prezi is that it allows people to collaborate remotely. So, they have put in this sort of Google Docs feature that more than one person can work together. And the idea is that hopefully students are not only discussing what they're going to include in the Prezi, but also talking about what, how, and why it makes most sense um, to structure the information the way that you do. The um, downside of Prezi is that it does have a steep learning curve. And so this morning, I was at the presentation for Hypothesis where they suggested to have the first assignment be a low stakes, sort of not your first project engaging with the material. You need to figure out how to use it. You need to play with it. You need to have time to do that. Um, and when I give my own students the option of using Prezi or something else, I say, if, if you don't really have the time to sit down and experiment with this, this is probably not the best place to start. Um, it is easy to get caught up in the sort of fancy technology of it and to lose that awareness. And I think that's when people start to think, why is, why is this better than PowerPoint? You have to be really intentional about it. Um, particularly with high school students, I found that that's hard to achieve. And then the final sort of drawback, which can, instead of being seen as a drawback, can be seen as a point of conversation, is the idea of privacy. Um, if you have a .edu email address, you can, for free, get a little bit more privacy than you would if you were just using Gmail or whichever um, email server you use. But the default is basically that your presentation is public and that anyone can edit it however they want. Um, and as a student who is putting something together quickly or who is jumping into this new software that's so exciting and has all this zooming, it's very easy to forget to think about that element. Yeah, the point of the Prezi, the point of, the reason we used it really for two reasons. One is I wanted students to think visually about the text they were reading. 
but also it was a way for them to map, and this was their final project, to create a treasury that was a visual, sil visual syllabus, and it was a way of marking relations among the texts that we had read over the course of a linear semester, and to do that a little bit more um, interrelationally, and so to, to, for them to reflect about the connections and disconnections among the texts that we read, and I think for that it actually worked pretty well. So just to end quickly, I'll just say quickly for, for myself, one of the concerns I have about using this technology is that um, I feel more and more of my students are learning the things they think, so to speak, will be on the test, the things that they need to know. And in, so that means if we're going to use a certain technology, um, TA and Mark is a good example, it needs to be so integrated into the course that they feel they have an investment. It's important for them to learn it, even if it's just for the test. And my concluding thought is just that when you're using these technologies, it's important to ask for feedback to see how they're being received to see whether your intention for the technology is the same, is matching with the effect that it's really having. We make it? I did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we'll open up the floor for five and a half minutes of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about um, the process you used to train the students in the technology and what was your approach to teaching them to use it? So the librarians, the librarians came in one day and sort of demonstrated everything, and then also I think gave some information. If you need more help, come find us and things like that. And sort of right for the TAA markup stuff, we actually coordinated with another class. It was two classes. I was doing different classes for similar reasons, so we had a kind of combined workshop um, where students, and it was kind of this kind of low stakes where they could actually work together collaboratively and try and make mistakes and see how that worked. Uh, the iPads, it was more, kids sort of knew how to use the iPads, but it was more about the software and Google and thinking about searching and, and, and that technology. Um, and the Prezi's, that's something, and this was a mistake I'd made before where, you know, I said, here are five different things you could use, and they sort of had to decide which one. We started with the Prezi's from day one and, and, and had it integrated in the, in the so by the time they got to that final project, they were pretty adept at using it. So following up on the on the introduction of the technology, how did you, or how did you, or how would you um, introduce the iPad? In other words, what would be your low stakes sort of first breaking the ice um, exercise in using the iPad to get people starting to do to do that? I think. Um, I would say pick something that is related to the course, but but not, but sort of at that connection point with familiar. This is maybe why you took this course. I'm interested in learning more about this, mm -hmm. and um, starting with something that's familiar and saying let's explore this, and then you have to sort of just follow it organically. What is what does this and it just says, what, what questions does this bring up for you? And okay, now if you have that question, why don't you look that up on the iPad and now get that person? So you have to kind of go from person to person. One of the things we did, I don't know if we did, I don't think we did this, but we should have done this. Mm -hmm. And we did this sort of somewhere along the semester. Uh, and I actually don't know whether Google still does this, but if you did a search for an image on Google on the iPad, it would look different than if you did it on a desktop. Uh -huh. And that's because the real estate was different. So the, the layout was different. And, and actually, we looked at that different layout, the way that the iPad then presented the internet, represented the internet to you as a viewer next to, let's say, a, a Mac, okay, a computer. So that was the kind of way of getting to think about the iPad as a certain kind of technology, a certain kind of window that opened up certain things, and how you could manipulate it, could be manipulated by them. What wireless presentation software did you use to get the iPad images on your screen? I was, thinking, I was just I was trying to think of the name. Um, I can't remember. Okay. But you know, it it didn't always work. <laughs> That's what I meant. And um, you know, in in this kind of situation, if if we had something like a Chrome, uh, what is it called? Chromecast. Chromecast, or something like that, or it would have been a certain an easier technology, a simpler type would have been better in this case. Um, I, I, I should have. And I, is it air surfing? It's, it could be air surfing. Uh, I don't know has that, but I don't know. It could be air surfing. I can't remember. Solstice? No, that was no. a couple of years ago. No. 
It probably doesn't exist anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another one before oh, we go. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, John. Oh, uh, super quick. Just the Prezi, um, did your students actually use the collaborative feature in developing the presentation, or they each did their own? I think they each did their own. I think they each okay. did their own, that's right. Yeah. So. And, and that may have even been before the collaborative part was came into the picture. Okay. Yeah, what we did, one of the things that did that, we this issue of copyright came up when we were doing that, and that was actually an important pedagogical issue yeah. about what kinds of images you can use. So my other question was, um, by essentially forbidding people to use their own technology, you're hitting somebody who likes to take notes on their own technology. And maybe that was less of an issue three years ago. How did that work? Out? I don't think we forbid it. Did we forbid it? Well, I, I actually looked back at my notes, and it, it, there was one student who sort of after a few days brought her own iPad. Uh -huh. And it really changed the dynamic. And one thing that, that Ken said at the beginning of the class was, it's, I think, correct me if this is wrong, but more about how you, in this class, how you engage with the material and how you engage with each other than what you write down for later. Uh -huh. um, and I have that actually in my notes from, from our meetings. And so I think from the, from the beginning, there was this idea that it's not so much about making sure you write down everything everyone says. I was thinking if I did this, I might try to allow for a five or 10 minute kind of reflection time at the end in which people would be allowed to put together their, their notes or reaction. So I'm going to be able to take something out for you to some people who aren't penciled. There was someone, there was a student who wanted to tweet during the class. Oh, uh -huh. Which I still don't, I mean, I don't go on Twitter, but I didn't even know what that was then, really. And, but he did do it, so we did allow him to use his, his, his phone to tweet. And I can't really remember what, what came of that. Yeah. 